Welcome to this uh, new session of our course on moduli. I hope you had a good vacation in February and you got a little bit your, <coughs> your head free of moduli and phylogenetic trees. Today we have a kind of private group, as I say. Let me check just how many people are here. Yeah, quite a bit, but not too many, of course. So <coughs> as, I, as I already told you, I want to review today the basics we did up to now, because uh, we might have forgotten some details, so you just get a whole overview. And then in maybe in the th two or three more lessons in March, we want to prove the, the various statements of the main theorem about the moduli space. Okay? So <clears throat> uh, if you don't hear me or if you have a technical problem, just let me know. I hope it works out. And if the repetition is maybe too boring for you, I mean, you always have YouTube on your site, so you can also do a little bit of web browsing, web surfing. So we are on March 7 today. And so the purpose is not only to repeat what we did up to now, but also to show a little bit the beauty of the subject. Yeah? I think it's a, this involvement of phylogenetic trees and using the geometry of the phylogenetic trees is an interesting aspect, which at least for me was unknown uh, in mathematical arguments and proofs. Yeah? So we prove things in algebraic geometry, not only using commutative algebra, but fooling around in these crazy trees. Yeah? We go to this vertex, we go to this leaf, we cut it into two, and that's kind of a game. And at least for beginners as I am, it's quite enjoyable and fun. And I hope that I can transmit a little bit of this fun to you. So let me, let me start from zero. What is our objective? So we want to, we have several objectives, describe the orbit space. We take <coughs> n points in P1, and we take it modulo PGL2. So what does it mean to describe as a set? a variety or a scheme together with its geometric properties. So say it differently, we want a nice a nice moduli space. Yeah? So that's, of course, not enough. We also want to understand the invariance, also to study the PGL2 invariance. And we already saw these. These were the cross ratios. And we will come back to them a little bit later. <coughs> So in doing this, and now I will specify a little bit more, in each orbit we want to select a representative, a distinguished representative. Construct in each orbit a distinguished representative. And not in an arbitrary many manner. Of course, we could just use the axiom of choice and take something. We want to do it in a manner so that orbits which are close to each other correspond to points representatives which are close to each other. We have studied this already, this question. Okay. The next thing is, to be again more precise, uh, this uh, interpret 
P1 and PGL2 as a smooth variety, algebraic variety. And of course, we know that it will work. That, but this was a big step in a big step in history. So starting in the analytic setting, so you remember we talked about Teichmüller spaces and uh, different equivalence relations. To show that something that the moduli space is a manifold, this was a big step because at the beginning it was not even no known what would be the correct differentiable structure. Yeah? Alfors, Bears, and many other people, Teichmüller, worked on this very hard. And then with Mumford and Dillin, there came this passage to the algebraic viewpoint and to see these things as algebraic varieties, which means they can be defined in this setting and taking convenient objects which we want to parameterize to see this in terms of equations. Okay? So <clears throat> this three will be easy, but the next step is compactify P1n, not PGL2, conveniently. And of course, conveniently is an ambiguous word, but it corresponds, and this was a whole series of, of lessons we had, it corresponds to understand what are limits by understanding limits of orbits, or if you want, by understanding limits of the representatives of the orbits, or of their representatives. So when I may uh, sorry, I was I was going too fast. So you should have corrected me because if I say here as a smooth algebraic variety, we were thinking not of whole P1 to the N, but we want to take something open inside here open in P1n, namely, we wanted to take P1n minus the diagonal, minus the big diagonal mod PGL2. So uh, maybe this is confusing. When I write this here, I should have written P1n minus delta n. And the compactification tries to enlarge this open subset by allowing points entries to coalesce. So allow entries of n tuples to come together. And this cannot be arbitrary. So of course, we start with x equals x1 up to xn, all xi pairwise distinct. And when we consider limits, we have to say precisely what we allow. Yeah? When we have a family of such, this was called an n-gon n gone in P1, what we allow. Huh? First, to what extent the entries may become equal. Yeah? It doesn't make sense to allow all to be equal. Yeah? That's not an interesting case. So the golden rule is keep at least three pairwise distinct entries. Okay. 
So that's one, one requirement that not all entries can come together. And second, the question is, how do we, how many points do we add in the limit? Yeah? And this will be done uh, in the construction later on. Yeah? So how many limits do we want to add? And I give you an example. If you have here x1, x2, x3, x4, pairwise distinct, and then you may allow x3 and x4 to come together. But it could be that these two come together very fast. And at the same time, x1 and x2 come together. Uh, that's not a good example. I need, I need also x5. Otherwise, it doesn't work. x4 is not the interesting case. Sorry. So <clears throat> hold on. I have to get used to these machines again. So let me just explain a little bit. So assume that x1 and x2 are fixed, are stable, but x3, x4, and x5 go to the same z no? in the limit. So now you could, as these become equal, you could just add one limit. Yeah? But you could also say maybe x3 and x4 go very fast to z, and x5 goes very slowly to z. Okay? This might be different from x3 going very slowly to z, x4 going very slowly to z, and x5 going very fast to z. Now, and you have to decide if you want to treat this type of limit and this type of limit as a different limit or not. Yeah? So if you want to count the velocity or the ratio of velocities, how points, entries come together as different limits or not. Yeah? That's a completely open question at the beginning. Afterwards, when we do the construction and it works out fine, you say, ah, now I'm happy. But if you start with this problem from scratch, it's not clear how to do it. Okay? So we will, on the way, we will solve all these questions. Okay. So number five is to show that the compactification show that compactification is smooth and irreducible. This is the irreducibility is a theorem of De Lin and Mumford, and the smoothness is due to Knudsen Mumford. Number six is the construction of a universal family. Construct universal family. So now I need a little bit of of notation, <coughs> this compactification was called xn, and this was contained in something yn, which I will define both in a minute. And actually, they are equal, but we don't know it yet. We didn't prove that they are equal. So xn was a certain Zariski closure, yn was defined by equations. Okay? So construct universal family, which looks like fo the following. You go one step higher, and you go down to xn by forgetting, and again, I will make it precise in a little bit later today, forgetting the last entry of n-gons. Okay. 
So what does it mean to have a universal family? Let me briefly recall. Now this cleaning business starts again. So let me call this map here pi. And being a universal family, it corresponds that whenever t to xn is a parametrized curve, find a lifting, yeah, how should I say? So when you, when you map t to xn, you can look at the image, and you can take the restriction of pi over the image of t. So let me call this alpha, find <coughs> a family pi restricted to alpha t. Now this goes from pi inverse of alpha t. I'm a little bit imprecise here, but <coughs> we don't need it at the moment. We will come back to it in detail when we do the construction. But just remember, we had a concept of universal family for moduli problems. And the last objective which we will have is that our constructions reproduce uh, show that our xn reproduces the lin mumford knudsen compactification. M0n bar. OK. So there is a. There's a funny point that <coughs> the elements of M0n or M0n bar are equivalence classes of objects. So you have orbits here, or equivalence classes or isomorphism classes. <coughs> Our space Xn will be different because it will have just points, which we call strings in this case. And so the equivalence relation to a certain extent disappears. Yeah? So it's already, in some sense, the elements here will already, already be representatives. Yeah? The strings which we define will already be representatives of equivalence classes here. Okay? But we will see this only later. So that's a little bit the program. And I want to recall. Uh, uh, the constructions, and with this also the terminology which we used. Because uh, I think it's quite uh, elegant how this works. So there again, there are several steps. And the first one was what, something that we called symmetrization. And uh, so we had un. This was p1n minus delta n as a subset of p1n, the set of n gons with pairwise distinct entries, as I should have written before. And we take m0n un mod pgl2. So these are the orbits or the equivalence classes of such of such n-gons. 
And uh, the clue, and this is maybe the, the most important step, is to, to consider the symmetrization map sigma n, which goes from, first it goes from un to p1 n times n2, 3, sending x to what we call a string. And the string is just a long, long vector. It consisted of many n guns. You recall this notation, xt t was a triple in n over 3. So n was, of course, a set. You can think n as a set 1 up to n. So the vectors of a string are n guns xt. So this is in p1 to the n for every triple t. And the requirement was that <coughs> the xt has prescribed values at the entries of t. So I think I need a little bit more space because I want this space here. So this symmetrization, as I already told you, appears in work of Van der Putt and Herrlich. But they only use it a little bit. They don't really exploit it. And we will profit of it much more. So if t was i, j, k, such a triple, then x, t, i was supposed to be 0, x, t, j was supposed to be 1, and x, t, k was supposed to be infinity. You remember this. So this, <coughs> of course, is well defined. Yeah? And uh, as the n gon x has pairwise distinct entries, for any given t triple i j k, we can find an element in the orbit of x yeah, with this condition. Okay. So this is well defined. But we take all t, we take all t in order not to privilege some entries of x. Yeah? We do it for all. Okay. And now we go to the m0n. Which is un, we go to the orbits. And it's obvious to see that if we take here x, two n gons, x and y in un, which are equivalent to each other with respect to pgl2, then they will be mapped to the same string. So now we cut this out, and we get an embedding here. Okay. And this is something we call xi n, but maybe I just call it sigma n again. So let's already quite interesting for the following reason. As I said before, m0n is a set of orbits, yeah? so a set of sets, no? pgl2 orbits. By this map, yeah, the string x is an element in p1 to the n times n over 3, and there's no more, no more action of a group here. Yeah? The elements here are just strings. Yeah. And we don't compare equivalent strings. They are just there. And in some sense, these strings here are already representatives of equivalence classes in M0n. Okay. So maybe I should write this down. Note, no equivalence relation. between strings. X 
So that's kind of funny. We, we, eliminate, <laughs> we eliminate the equivalence classes in one step. Yeah? And then, of course, we have to study the image. Yeah? So the image, we denoted it by Vn. This was either sigma n of un or psi n of m0n inside p1 and n choose 3. OK. I guess that you remember a little bit the notation. And uh, obviously, the elements, <coughs> the many n-gons xt will have the same cross ratio. So if x is in Vn, and I will define the cross ratio again afterwards, x equals <coughs> xt, t in n true 3, then cross xs q is equal to cross q xt for all. Now, these are quadruples. Remember that the cross ratios were selecting four entries of an n-gon. So this was what we denoted n to the power of 4. Feel free to interrupt me if I'm going too slowly or if I'm skipping something you would like to know. Okay. So <coughs> we have represented m0n already as a subset of p1 n n to 3, and the dimension is n minus 3, as is easily seen. But this is, of course, not closed. Uh, Vn is not closed. And then we take, we take uh, script xn equal Vn, the Zariski closure. Now, one word on this, on this Zariski closure, which in some sense defines the limit, defines allowed limits of n-gons. And now you see something which is very nice. In xt, xt here, an n-gon here, has 0, 1, and infinity fixed at the entries i, j, k. Now, if you take a limit, if you take a limit of such xt's, 0, 1, and infinity will keep constant. Yeah, as they keep constant, yeah, by definition here inside this space, uh, we will always have in the limit three different entries, at least, yeah, because we will have 0, 1, infinity, maybe with repetitions, but at i, j, k, we will have already our three different entries. I just give you a hint. If you do instead of p1 to the n, you could also look at the plane. You could look at n points in the projective plane p2. And then you would have to prescribe the position of four entries of our n-gons. But then the action of pgl3 is much more complicated because you have to not only have to assume that they are pairwise distinct, you know, that in an, in an n-gon x you have three pairwise distinct entries, you have to assume that in this n-gon you have a, a quadrilateral which is non-degenerate. So you have to work also with the collinearity of the points. And in the generic case, you don't allow that three points lie on a single line. Okay, So that's much more interesting, uh, the case of P2, but we don't have too many results on P2, only observations. Uh, it's very fascinating. And maybe in the last class, I come back to this. But let's stick for the moment to our P1. OK. So this is the first construction, symmetrization. The second one were cross ratios. Cross ratios. And these are kind of magic. So these are the, these are the PGL2 invariants. And uh, 
we had just to recall the notation, if we have a quadruple, then we took zi minus zk, zj minus zl, divided by zi minus zl, zj minus zk. So this was <coughs> a rational function in variables z. And then we can evaluate. We can evaluate if x is an n gone in p1 to the n and q is such a quadruple, we get by substituting the variable zi by the entries of x, we get what we call the cross ratio q of x with respect to this four tuple. So this, if you want, you could write this as xi, xj, xk, xl. Now this is a value, and it is easy to see if x is in un, which means pairwise distinct entries, then the cross ratio lives in p1 minus 0, 1, infinity. So that's the generic value. Now, <clears throat> as you go to the limits of such n-gons, the cross ratio may take values equal to 0, 1, and infinity. It might be special. And I will give you the list when, when it happens. But if in these four entries, xi, xj, xl, xk, xl, three are equal, then you easily see that the evaluation is not defined. Yeah? So we will always assume that our n gons x, when we compute the cross ratio, it's only defined if at least three entries are different. Okay. So <clears throat> it is clear that. The cross ratio <coughs> is a continuous function. So as the strings, as the n-gons of the strings <laughs> let me write this down. If x is a string in this Vn, x is xt, t in n over 3. Then the cross ratios are equal, as I said before. Then we can define cross q of x is defined for all Q in n choose 4. Yeah. Because the cross ratio does not depend on the choice on the, of the n gon on which we evaluate. Yeah. It may happen that for some xt, the cross ratio of xt is not defined. But we can always find one where it is defined. And this is the same value for all n gons. So this is something which is defined in terms of the string. Okay. And uh, if x is in un, yes, in un, so in n-gon, sorry, then let me recall cross q to q i j k l, x is a special value, 0, if and only if xi equals xk or xj equals xl cross qx is 1, xi equals xj, or and or is not ex exclusive. It could be both, xk equals xl and cross qx 
with infinity if and only if xi equals xl or xj equals xk. So the value of the cross ratio tells us about identities between the entries. And cross q x not defined if three entries equal. Just to have it on the board. So you see, it, it's a, a bit of details, but it's quite systematic. Now we have the triple product formula. I think I'm the only one who calls it the triple product formula. But I think it's a nice name. And I call it like this because it reminds me of the Jacobi triple product formulas for binomial coefficients and combinatorial identities. So <coughs> it reads ij kl, ij km, no m. Sorry, Lm. We move L, delete K. We have to take it symmetric. And then Mk is 1 with this notation here, easy to prove. So this implies that we can express. Now, if we invert the order of 2 of k and l, then we come go to the inverse. So we get i, j, k, m. I invert here m and k. So I get the inverse here, put it on the other side, and we get i, j, k, l times i, j, l, m. And this will be used over and over in the SQL. OK. Now we define yn, and this will contain xn, and all this will take place in p1n and 2 3. So these are now here. We have a string x, and the condition is that <coughs> the n-gons t in n over 3, the requirement is, again, this condition here. I don't write it again. So we always require that at the prescribed places we have values 0, 1, and infinity. And we just assume that the cross ratio xs equals the cross ratio of xt for all ts in n true 3 and for all q quadruples n4. And as I said before, as xn is the Zariski closure, by continuity, xn is contained in yn, by continuity of the cross ratio. <coughs> So how are you doing? Is it very complicated? Is it very boring? Are you still alive? I'm really a little bit uh, alone here. I just see your names. But I hope that you enjoy a little bit at least listening to all this. What about the time? <clears throat> so I will continue a little bit, and then we will have a break, as usual. So by the way, thank you for your feedback. So you, you many of you f filled out the evaluation sheet. And it was really pleasing how positive your reactions were. Thank you very much. That's almost too much of, of compliments, but uh, I enjoyed it very much. OK. Construction number three is the projection map.
of course, I already sent you the notes where most of this material is inside, but often it is more convenient to hear it uh, in a life than to read it in uh, notes. So <coughs> we take n is a set of labels of y n, and then we take we add a new label a labels of y n plus 1, and then we consider pi from y n plus 1 to y n. So if we have here a string y, so this will be t. Now, this is I call this n union a, I call it n plus 1. So if we take now triples involving a, yeah, and each yt will be in p1 to the n plus 1. So the triple t may involve a or not. And the n plus 1 gone yt will have at the end a yt a. Let's say a is the last label which appears here. Okay. So how is this defined? y goes to a string x by forgetting everything which has to do with a. By forgetting all yt with t involving a, which means the triple is in n union a, but not in n. Okay. I write it like this by abuse of language. And by forgetting all last entries y t a. Well, that's naturally defined. It's a projection. So <clears throat> this x here will be x t t in n. So here is n over 3, n to 3. And how is this? does this work? Where this x t is just y t x t y t a. OK? So forgetting yta for all t in n2, 3. This is a projection map. So we get the fiber. This will be one of the key objects to consider. Fibers pi inverse of a string x inside yn. So <clears throat> what is this? We will see later on that these are stable curves. So these are y in yn plus 1 and uh, yt equals xt, sorry, xt yta for t in n two 3. <coughs> and the condition is that the cross ratio, as we are inside here, this means again that the cross ratio Q y s equals the cross ratio Q y t, but now for all s t in n plus 1, 2, 3, for all quadruples in n plus 1, 4. Okay? That's the projection map. We don't need it at the moment, but we will come back to it. So <clears throat> before the break, I want to, to make a technical uh, statement, which will be used in the proofs later on, and which is quite easy to prove. So a small lemma, and then we will make the break. So when you have a, such a string x or y, 
it has many, many components. No? For every triple, you have a component, you have an n-gon. And it turns out that the quality of cross ratio gives a very strong restriction on the various n-gons you have. And in fact, it's so restrictive that some of the n-gons are completely determined by the other ones. And that's the statement of the lemma. So let me, let me show you here again. This condition here, yt is of this shape. It just means we project down to xt yeah, here in this. But this concerns only the t in n over 3. Yeah. What about the triples which involve a? So the yt for t involving a, the lemma shows that these yt are already determined by the yt where t is in n over 3. So let me write this down. The projection. I think we, I mentioned it already in the ordinary class, but I'm not sure if I proved it. Let me call it tau. Now we go, we have to take a little bit of care. P1, we are in n plus 1. So we have n plus 1 over 3. And we go down to P1 to the n plus 1 times n over 3. And what do we do if we have y equals yt t in n plus 1 over 3? We just forget those n plus 1 gons whose t involves a. So we just go to, let me call it again, x yeah. equals yt t in n over 3. So it's a, it is a projection. Now we forget many of the n plus 1 gons. But here, this x is maybe not a good, it's not a string in the usual sense, because these are n plus 1 gons, n plus 1 gons. So maybe, maybe to be more precise, I just don't write anything here. Okay. The projection induces an isomorphism from yn plus 1 to its image tau yn plus 1. So in words, We can forget in y the n plus 1 gons yt with t involving a. I think I will change soon my, my pen because it's getting dry. Uh, Yeah. Let me do the proof and then the proof. Very simple proof. Uh, we did it in the typed version. So express these redundant yt's through cross ratios in the entries of the yt t in n choose 3. C is a typed version. C notes. 
It's not very complicated, but I don't want to do it here. It's just a simple calculation. So this is very useful to study the fibers of our map pi, yeah. Yeah. to show that so later on, remark used to show that fibers pi inverse x are stable curves. But uh, we are not there yet. Okay. So <clears throat> the next thing I want to recall are the phylogenetic trees. Of course, you are already experts in phylogenetic trees, but we will look at it again. But before doing so, let's have a five minutes break. See you in a moment. OK, I hope you are back from the break. And we continue uh, a little bit more, some half an hour, uh, coming to our uh, phylogenetic trees.
we change color, hoping that the pen is better. Phylogenetic trees. So, you, what was a phylogenetic tree? So that's a <coughs> t is a finite graph without loops. So it is a tree with no vertices. Of degree two. And of course, no double edges and things like this. So the, the vertices of degree one are called the leaves. Degree one vertices. And they are labeled. So by <coughs> i in n. n is a finite set of cardinality small n. And the, the other vertices are the inner vertices. So degree at least 3. I think I, for the moment I don't have to draw a phylogenetic tree. You, we have seen this over and over. So there are some interesting trees, which are, for instance, the generic one. The generic tree, it just has one inner vertex and uh, many leaves, one inner vertex and leaves. And we have, on the other side, the most special one, which we call the extremal tree. All inner vertices degree 3. So I used two colors to indicate this would be an extremal tree. And here, of course, this would be green in the middle. Okay. So you see here, you have two options. So either you have a, a vertex which has two leaves and just one inner neighbor, or you have a vertex which has three inner neighbors. And then here you have one which has one leaf and two inner neighbors. Okay, So these are here the vertices, of course. I don't know how many trees I have already drawn. And here are the leaves. And then you can number them one, two, three, four, five. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. This is an extremal tree. And they will be, will be used, maybe I write this down, used in the smoothness proof. Smoothness proof for xn. Then we have the concept of bamboo. <clears throat> so that's just a stick. So you have no bifurcations with inner edges, and then you may have an any number, any number of leaves. Okay. And uh, these green edges here are called the inner edges. And the red ones are, you could call them outer edges. And the leaves are attached to an inner, unique inner vertex. Okay. So 
we will have some operations on these trees. And one which will appear soon is the contraction of inner edge. All these operations will have a geometric counterpart for our moduli space. So for instance, let us look at yeah. Let us look at this edge here. Do you see it? We can contract this edge to just one vertex. And then we would get <clears throat> we would get from this tree, we would get this one. And now you see that here you will have, oh, something is wrong. What did I do? No, no, it's OK. Sorry. Uh, this was too much. You should have corrected me. We have two here, two here, and two here. Uh, I hope you can see it. It's not very nice. So we see that now we have a vertex of degree 4. We can contract this further. For instance, we could correct now this edge here. And then we would get OK, so we contract this here. And then uh, it would result in having something like this. And we can go on and on. And where do we end up if we contract all the edges? The last one will be the generic one. with as many leaves as the first one. Okay. So that's the process we will use uh, soon. Then we will have another process which we call clipping leaves. Maybe I draw again. this tree. But let me now assume that we have here, for instance, three, three leaves. And this is, let's say, label J. And we just cut it off. Yeah? That's no problem, because uh, we will still have, if we take away j and this outer edge, we still have a phylogenetic tree. So I just write it down. Delete j and its edge. But if we do it here, let me call it k. If we delete k, we have a problem, because then this vertex here will have degree 2. So in this case, we have to do something else. We take this green edge and this red one and put it into one red edge. So deleting k, delete k and its edge, and glue or contract this this part here which remains sorry this one we contract it to just one outer edge 
So let me call this here i, then we will keep here i. Okay. So these two are contracted to this one. That's what we call clipping leaves. Then a concept which we already introduced, but which I will recall, meeting point of three leaves. So I think I can show it on this one here. So we take three leaves in EG. Let us take 1, 4, and 9. 1, 4, and 9. So that's the inner vertex is inner vertex, <clears throat> which, if we delete it, gives us three components, three connected components, so that the three leaves live in different components. Yeah. So here's a meeting point. I will do it. I will make a square. Would be this one. If we delete this vertex here and keep half edges, then we have three connected components. And 1, 4, and 9 are each in a different component. Whose deletion? creates a irreducible connected component. Such that 1, 4, 9 live in different components. I think it's quite clear that what I mean. And it's also, we have shown already that it always exists. Always exists and is unique. This is the meeting point. And then I think I keep this picture here so I I erase on this side. Uh, you have seen this here. In any case, we, we did this already. So one more thing which we need is uh, are the destination sets. So these are the train stations we can reach from the various exits of an inner vertex. So again, I just make a picture. Let us now consider this vertex here. And it has three edges. So exiting from this vertex through this edge, we can arrive at label 11 and 10. Here we get 1, 2, 3. And here we get 4, 2, 9. So let me call this maybe v. V will give us 1, 2, 3, 3 up to 9, and 10, 11. So we get a partition, a set partition of capital N, our set of labels. These are the destinations. And then for each v, we will get such a partition. So v will define something like this, iv partition of n. And the funny thing, which is quite easy to prove, is that two vertices are adjacent. v, w inner vertices are adjacent. If and only if 
I V and I W share a complementary partition set. So if you take for W this vertex here, then uh, we will have this here, 1, 2, 3, 11, 10 as one partition set. And it is complementary to this one, which is a partition set of V. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, we proved already that there are three properties which are defined. Uh, so for, all, for each vertex, we get such a partition. And the properties are, maybe I'm not sure if I should write them. Uh, yeah, let me recall. So each label i in n is a singleton of precisely one in a vertex v, which means the set i is in the per IV number two for all I in IV with at least two elements. <clears throat> there exists a unique W in a vertex with IC, which is N minus I in I W. And the third condition <coughs> is that these partition sets have at least three elements. That's what we call arboral covering of N. And <coughs> sorry, the proposition was. So you see, we already have quite a bit of material. The proposition was that uh, not only we get an arboreal covering with these properties, but every arboreal covering of n uh, produces by the opposite rule <coughs> a phylogenetic tree a unique phylogenetic tree. And it was not very difficult to do it. You define the set of inner vertices, you define the set of leaves, and you define the set of edges using three, three properties. OK. <clears throat> I am not sure if we should stop here. Or if we go on, I think it was already quite a lot. And uh, maybe the next item would be incidence partitions. Maybe at least I write it down. Number five, incidence partitions. So this was going from strings to phylogenetic trees associate to strings in yn phylogenetic trees and how did we do this you look at the n-gons of your string and then you look in this n gon which entries are equal. So you just keep a book on the quality of entries of the n gons And this will give you, as we proved, an arboral covering. And from this arboral covering, you get your phylogenetic tree. I will work this out 
in some detail next time. And then <coughs> recall the result that associating to a string in y and a phylogenetic tree, which we call the incidence tree or the incidence graph of the string, we get all phylogenetic trees with n leaves. So this is a complete characterization of phylogenetic trees. That's the first proposition. <clears throat> and then we will start to prove next time, and that's not for today, that our space, our variety yn, is smooth. And we will prove the smoothness by looking at extremal trees as before, taking in a, into account uh, n-gons, which are extremal in the above sense of the tree. And <clears throat> then we also need these concepts of clipping leaves and contraction of edges. Okay? But I think for the restart, this was enough for today. So I will send you again the link of the, of the recording. Yeah, it's the same as usual. And we will also have to discuss a little bit the time. <clears throat> there will not be too many sessions in March, maybe two or three. But it could be that I have to move from Monday to an earlier time or to Tuesday. But this we keep in contact by email. Okay. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's again a kind of uh, not only exciting experience, but it's also a little bit, as I said many times, <clears throat> a little bit delicate because you really talk to a black wall in front of you and the camera. But I hope that I can at least transmit a little bit of the fascination of this subject, and I'll be happy if you join us again next week. Take care, and if you have any comments or questions or feedback, feel free to write me an email. I'll be always happy to get messages from your side. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining, and see you then. Bye-bye.